yesterday at all. Like I tried to record it three times. It says we're live, so we'll see if it stays that way. All right, so today is our last lecture on Greece. Um, and so if you were out when we discussed the fun and fantabulous times of the Greek Empire, glad you were back. Okay, so we will go in together and kind of look at what you still have to do. Make sure if you have late things, everything that is this term, once this term is over, it's all she wrote. So there is there is no late stuff uh, for this term. The nice thing about that is you start over, second term. Uh, I keep it that way, even though technically we could do it a little different with BNJC. It just it makes your grade right in the grade book. Otherwise, that's kind of a pain. So make sure that you're getting anything in that you want me to at least give you credit for. All right. So we are at, I think for you guys, is it lecture 11 or lecture 12 for you? 11. Okay. Because it's a little different for you from the other class because I broke those up. But I know it says 14 up here, but that's, you know, something different. All right. Um, yes. Did you get your stuff yesterday? Yeah, if you got it yesterday, you should be doing that. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about the life of Alexander the Great. It's going to be a large part of our discussion. Not all of it, but it will at least get you kind of where you need to go with that. All right, for you guys, I think it's, what did y'all say it was, 12? Yeah, because I took two days on one lecture with one of the classes, and I didn't with the other to kind of catch up, and then to lecture 12. All right, so... That's where we're going to end up, a little preview there. All right, so today we're going to talk about the age of empires in the Greek Empire. This is when Greece really makes its way in the world, so to speak. So Macedonia and the Hellenistic world. Now, when you hear the term Hellenistic world, that probably means nothing to you. But just for future reference, that is also referring to kind of like Troy, Helen of Troy. It is named after her. So this is talking about basically the building of a Greek empire. Hey, we're still on, so that's a good sign. All right, the building of a Greek empire. So that's where we will be starting today. So with this, um, just to kind of show you the area. I, as you know, I like to use maps because I like for you to have at least you know, so it doesn't feel like we're talking about some weird fictional place out there. I like for you to have just kind of in your mind an idea of the area. So to kind of put this in and remind you, we've done this once before, but let's look up. Um, so if you look, this is the Mediterranean Sea. And if you go behind Italy's boots, this is where Greece is. And in between Greece and Turkey here is the Aegean Sea. Now, some of these little islands, Turkey, uh, you see here where Cyprus is and Syria. Those are a couple places we might mention as well. So I just kind of like, if you have a good visual of that, it really does make talking about these places make a little more sense. So here you can see the same place. Kind of blown up. Now, when we talk about the Persian Empire, at this point, Persia has taken over Turkey. So you can see why these areas are going to be conflicting with these areas. They're kind of in the same playing field, right? And really where conflict comes in a lot of times has to do with trade. Because everybody wants that ocean so they can be shipping goods to different places because that's how you make the money, right? So keep that in mind as we discuss these. So, uh, and this shows you how, how goods are going to be flowing all over the place. It's, this is how far, when we talk about Alexander the Great, everywhere you see a red arrow, that's a place that he went and conquered, all out of his small little community. So let's just say he was on the run here, to say the least. All right. So let's start by talking about Alexander's kind of origin. So 
So in the community of Macedonia, Macedonia, also you will occasionally see it called Macedon. In this community of Macedonia, there was a king. And the king's name is Philip II. Now, it's interesting because we're going to spend our time not focused on Philip as far as the center of our story. But in a lot of ways, Philip is kind of the, the side. He's almost the, the antagonist to Alexander's protagonist, or maybe he is the... Alexander is the antagonist to his protagonist. Really depends on which way you read the story. Now, how many of you remember studying in school about Oedipus? Okay, so what's the deal with Oedipus? Kind of creepy. Yeah, wasn't he like the son? She was supposed to kill him, but she didn't. She has to the family. Then he ended up coming back and fulfilling his prophecy. So there was this prophecy before Oedipus was born, supposedly. And Oedipus, there's a Greek tragedy that is written about him. And the prophecy was that he would marry his mother and kill his father. So his um, parents, when he's born, they send him out in the woods with this guy, basically. And they're like, killing. And so the guy gets out in the woods, and he feels like, it's almost like a Snow White story. And he feels like, ah, I just can't quite do this. So he, he turns him over. To this poor family that lives kind of out in the middle of nowhere. And so the poor family raises him, and when he gets a little older in the Greek tragedy, Oedipus comes across an oracle, a person who tells um, the future, basically. And he says, what's my future? And he says, well, you're going to kill your dad and marry your mom. Now, he thinks the two people who have raised him are his dad and mom. So he tries to leave. So he tries to leave because, you know, I mean, that's just kind of weird. And so he's like, well, whatever would cause me to kill my dad. I don't want to do that. I love my dad. You know, I don't want to marry my mom, so I'm going to leave. And so he goes into town. Have you ever heard of the Sphinx? Not the actual Sphinx, like in Egypt. But in Greek mythology, there's a Sphinx. And so it is this several-headed monster. And it was right outside this community, and it kept blocking the way. And so Oedipus comes across this thing, and it basically says, I'll tell you a riddle. And if you can solve the riddle, then you can go past me, and if not, I'm going to kill you. And so Oedipus is like, cool. So Oedipus says, tell me the riddle. And he asks him, what crawls on four legs in the morning, two legs in the afternoon, and one in the e or in three in the evening? And Oedipus solves the riddle by saying it's man. Because a baby is on four legs in the morning. They crawl on four different pieces. In the afternoon, they walk on two legs. And in the evening, they walk on three because of the idea of pain. So it's like your cycle of life. And this sphinx creature becomes so upset, it like throws itself in the, it like basically kills itself. It's like, oh, I'm so upset, I'm going to jump in this big ravine and die. And so what it also happens, so he gets into this quarrel with this very antagonistic man who he ends up killing. Guess who that is? And so he makes it all the way into this new community. And the community basically said, well, our king died kind of recently. And, you know, we've been tormented by this mythical creature. And you killed that mythical creature. And since you did that, guess what? You get to marry our queen and become our new king. And so he does. And so the story goes that he actually he has two children by the queen. And when they get older, he realizes that he has married his mother and killed his father. And so he actually takes out um, sharp rocks or glass or something and stabs his own eyes out. So, uh, and I don't recall if he killed himself or, but anyway, there's another Greek tragedy called uh, Antigone. Antigone. Antigone is what it looks like, but it's Antigone. And it's his daughter's story. How she feels sorry. She, like, I think the mother, no, the mother kills herself. Dad just stabs his eyes out. Mm -hmm. Well, his, his mother slash her mother slash grandmother kills herself. And so Antigone goes and, like, buries her, like, puts some dirt on her because they believe you could, your soul could be at rest and taking dirt on you. And because of that, she gets arrested and in trouble anyway. Three tragedies are always tragic. Now, it's kind of, it is weird. It's kind of interesting, the parallels, although he never has a daughter 
who like has to bury her mother and all that kind of crazy stuff. But the parallels in his early life, kind of to the story of Oedipus. So let's talk about that. So Alexander the Great is going to be considered one of the most brilliant minds in human history. The Macedonian general amassed an impressive ancient empire that is going to stretch from Greece all the way to the Indus Valley. And he changes the future of those he conquered by introducing Greek culture and ideas. Now, it must be noted that the study of Alexander the Great is not a completely unbiased study. Because the only primary sources that exist are about Alexander and his campaign written by the people who traveled with him, not the people he went against. So their story may be a little different. You know, where they talk about Alexander being fair. Well, if you're the person who he's conquering, you may not feel it's as fair. And so we really don't have both sides of the story. Does that make sense? But what we do have, it seems like he's just this super great guy. And so anyway, as we said, Philip, his dad-ish, which we'll talk about shortly, was an ambitious conqueror in his own right. So once Philip becomes king, his goal is to conquer Greece. He wants to take all of Greece. So Philip whips his army into shape using different Greek and Macedonian techniques. He spends most of his time on military campaigns. And while he's away from home, he behaves himself like any typical royal at the time who feels that he can do whatever the heck he wants to do. Uh, in fact, he drank heavily, and he had many mistresses. Well, he's married. But again, I mean, this was pretty typical behavior. And so Philip's wife finds out. Oh, by the way, this is Alexander the Great, if you were just curious. <laughs> All right. And this is one of the few... Um, Images of Alexander that was actually made by somebody who would have been, who claims to have seen him and been alive during his time. This was part of the art done by the Persians. They would do this really cool little art that was basically a mosaic. All these different little pieces that they would paint. I think mosaics are extremely cool. And let me show you Mama, or what we have of Mama, maybe. Where is she? Maybe not. There she is. So this is supposed to be a likeness of Olympia, his mother. So Olympia gets mad at Philip because Philip is out drinking and carousing and winching and all of these kind of things. And so she says, that's okay because guess what? Alex isn't your son. Now, it's not the most far-fetched thing in the world. However, what is interesting is who she claims Alex was fathered by. What is the most far-fetched possibility of whom could have fathered Alex? Good guess, but it's worse. It's more interesting, I should say. Well, if you've studied much Greek mythology, it's Zeus! Oh, Zeus is the daddy. She says, that's okay. He's Zeus's child. So his dad's the leader of the gods. Good job. So, you know, like, so now he has this, like, demigod concept, right? Like, that's okay, because my dad's Zeus. And, you know, yeah. So, anyway, she's like, well, it doesn't matter, because guess what? Zeus and I hooked up, and that's who Alex's daddy is, not you. So, that kind of caused some problems with Philip, to say the least. And so, while he was away, Alexander and Olympia developed very close ties. Now, she was probably very young when she married Philip, but there's actually some evidence that she and Alex were involved as well. Yeah, that's kind of gross. Different culture, different time, still kind of gross. Uh, if you watch the movie Alexander the Great or Alex the Great or something along those lines, I'll show you a, uh, a trailer for it in a little bit. Uh, Angelina, I think it's Angelina Jolie that plays the mother in that. And so she, and it kind of insinuates pretty strongly that she and Alex had a relationship. And again, kind of interesting. The Greeks were kind of interesting. So anyway, um, 
Enough about their family drama, which is enough to keep us busy for a while. So let's put a date in here. 338 BC. Three thirty-eight BC. Alex has this big moment. He proved himself a very capable military leader. You see, Philip is attacking in a battle of uh, Sharona. It's called the Battle of Sharona. And Alex comes along, leading a cavalry unit. That means he's on horseback. That's the image that I showed you of him earlier. It was supposed to be from the Battle of Sharona where he is on the horse and fighting alongside his men. And so he leads this brilliant charge that helps turn the battle, and it makes a very significant victory for the Macedonians. And so this battle gives Philip control over almost all of Greece. So it's a big win for Daddy here, well, his earthly father. And so, once Philip was stable in Greece, he announced that his new purpose was to attack the Persian Empire. So, at this point, Philip has basically taken over, if you will. Philip's got all this area down pat through here. See, that's the green area. So, now Philip wants to head on over to Persia. Let's just, for kicks and giggles, let's go this way, right? What's, what's a few more places? So, scholars believe Philip does this to pacify his new Greek subjects. Why? Well, in one of the last lectures we had when we were together, we talked about a Persian king by the name of Xerxes. Not to be confused with Xerxes the favorite. So, Xerxes had ticked them off around 480 B.C., so about 150 years prior. And so, historians believe that Philip hoped to use Persian riches to pay for his large army. So his guys are like, yeah, we need to go get the Persians back for what they did to our great-grandparents. I mean, 150 years, y'all, that's how long ago the Civil War was. However, great analogy, because think about all the conversations that still come out of that. So, you know, interestingly enough, it's a long time, but to some people it's not, you know, People still argue over some of those things and what should be done or said. And so it's not as long as it might seem. But telling me about the hurricane. Okay. So anyway, so once he gets this, he is ready to kind of make some money off of it. However, Philip never saw the campaign happen. In 336 BC, Philip is going to be assassinated. 336 B.C., back so soon, Philip is going to be assassinated. He was inside a theater in the city of Aegea. Inside a theater in Aegea. All right. So, Alexander the Great. He is now king. Now, this is interesting. There are a lot of questions about who killed him and why. There are some people who believe that Alex and his mother had Philip assassinated. Now, I'm not saying Alex did or didn't. You're fine, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Hanley said check your uh, email. Your exam is tomorrow, and he posted what, they, what it's going to be on. That's fine. You're fine, sweetheart. Thank you for coming. You're fine, this sweet of you. All right. So basically, I wouldn't be one bit surprised if Olympia did not have him. She wants her son to be king, right? So why, you know, why not take him out? Um, as far as if Alex himself is involved, and if really if she's involved, there's no actual proof. But the first thing Alex does as king is to order the execution of the men allegedly responsible for his father's death. Now, as someone who really likes to listen to a lot of forensic files and who enjoys true crime way too much, uh, I think about this. If he did do it, why do that so quickly? Kind of smart, isn't it? 
because then the case is done, solved, and closed. Somebody's already been convicted, somebody's already been put to death, it's over. You know, and if he didn't, this was his death on the earth, of course. So, you know, I mean, this was his dad. Obviously, he wanted to impress his dad. And so, it could be either way. So, he becomes the new king. And his reign was initially fraught with rebellion. Why? Because he's young. A lot of times, people think of people who are young as incapable. Uh, there's a story that you all should have learned in U.S. history when you learned about Khrushchev and Kennedy. And so Kennedy travels to Berlin to meet uh, former Russian leader, or Soviet Union leader, Khrushchev. And Khrushchev thinks Kennedy is like this big playboy who just wants to play and has no desire to, like, really care about the country. And so he responds by starting to build the Berlin Wall. And so a lot of times people see youth and inexperience as a weakness. And granted, it can be, but that doesn't always mean someone is weak. It's just because they're young. And so what Alex has to do when you're young a lot of times is you have to prove yourself. All right, so he ends up having to fight a revolt that launched in 335 B.C. 335 B.C. Now, this is just one year after his father died. And what ends up happening, without hesitation, Alex rode off with his soldiers and went to squash that rebellion. The particular rebellion itself was in the Balkans. The Balkans are going to be more the northern area here. And so the area that is the furthest from him, he immediately trucks it up to that area and says, yeah, we're putting this down. We're not dealing with this. And so it's pretty successful. He returns to Greece to stop another rebellion. And the next rebellion he's going to deal with are by the Thebes. And the Thebes are in this area. We talked about Thebes the other day. T-H-E-B-E-S. So it's kind of one of those things that sometimes you have to make an example out of somebody, right? Have you ever had a class where maybe a teacher was, and please don't call out names, but they were so harsh with one particular student that you were like, I will never do what that kid did. Like it was enough that you were done. <laughs> like you're like, yeah, I won't do that. Uh, I think about in one of my psychology classes that I took in college, and it actually was, it was actually a staged event, but uh, our professor wanted to show something around abnormal psychology. And so he had one of the students who he knew in there to say something to him, and he talked about how trigger things trigger certain people, and that was his whole process. And he started to throw things at this guy. It was like kind of traumatic, and then he, and then he's like, "Now, can you tell me what psychological disorder that was?" And I'm thinking, "Crazy, that's what that was. That was the disorder of crazy." But anyway, so what happens is Alex decides he puts down the Balkan revolt. Everybody's cool. Then the thieves start to revolt. He doesn't want to do this ten more times, right? Sometimes you got to put a stop to it. And so he decided to make the people of Thebes an example. So he completely decimates their city. He's like, all right, y'all want to play this way? I'm done with rebellions. Because after you see him decimate a city, you're like, okay, if we rebel, guess what's going to happen to us? And in fact, I referenced the Soviet Union, but the Soviet Union did that when Hungary and Poland revolted. When Hungary revolted first, they basically said, Okay, well, that's cool. We're going to give you some more rights. Well, then when Poland does it right after them, they're like, no, we're done with this. And so they squashed that rebellion very harshly. And so basically, he kind of puts a stop to this, and so it stops any other rebellions. So now Alex has a firm grip on Greece. He feels strong enough in his position that he feels it is now safe to leave the area of Greece and begin a campaign against the Persians. This is the same thing his dad had planned to do, right? What messed it up for his dad? He died. When you, when you die, it kind of screws up your future plans there, right? And so just as his father has planned, he's like, I'm going after the Persians. And so he takes after... Persia. Now, to tell you a little bit about this, um, he had already proved himself that he could command a military. 
And so now he finds himself against a weakened Persian army. Now, I think it's significant that the Persian army is weaker because it makes you look better, right? You know, if you talk about, uh, when you talk about sports, uh, we beat the team, you know, we beat such and such school. Well, maybe that year that school really wasn't good. You know, and then you come to another year and you lose to them horribly because they have five players that go to Division One or something. You know, it's different years are different years. And so at this point, their army is not so hot in Persia. This is also when they're under the leadership of a guy you and I talked about previously when we talked about Persia. And his name, too far, I think. There we go. Is Darius the Third? Remember, there was Darius the Great. And then you had another Darius, and then you had Darius the third, who kind of was down the food chain a little bit. So Persia still controlled all the land from Asia Minor to India. However, the term control here, they did not have very strong control over them. They were struggling. Their power, their best days were behind them, not ahead of them, for sure. So Alex and his army are going to leave the country of Greece in 34 BC. They leave the country of Greece in 34 or 334 BC, excuse me. So to go back to our previous map here and to kind of show you what that means. Where is it? Okay. So they are leaving here, and you see where that red line goes? This is when he crosses over into Asia or into uh, Asia Minor here, when he's getting into these Middle Eastern areas, particularly what today is known as Turkey. So he crosses over into Turkey. Now he has a pretty impressive army. He has thirty-five thousand soldiers. Thirty-five thousand. I mean, this is three hundred and thirty-four BC. That's that is more people than consider themselves residents of Pascagoula. And he's trucking out at this time to take him with him. With that, he also has 5,000 of those 35,000 are cavalrymen. That means they are on, they're on horses. The other 30,000 are infantrymen. And he also has some very significant other people. He hires siege engineers. Now, these are people who are trained in how to plan battles. <coughs> so he hires people to plan their attacks that are experts. He also hires historians. Because if you knew your history, you knew some things about um, the Persians. And so those people can help with what they knew about him. And he also hires doctors. So the expertise of these three groups are actually key to his success. Because he doesn't just fire blindly at these people. He goes with knowledge about who they are. So the army of Macedonia, or the Greeks, if you will, and the Persians met for the first time in a campaign for the city of Granicus. I don't know if you can see it. it is, it's right here, but I will spell it for you. Granicus. It's spelled exactly like it sounds. G-R-A-N-I-C-U-S. So this is going to be their first fight. The Persians were smart. Remember I told you where the historians and the doctors and the siege people are all going to be important. This is that moment. They knew what territory they had across this Granicus River. See, on the other side, they had the high ground. And they were prepared. Well, Alexander doesn't cross the river. He refuses to engage them there. He makes them come more to him. Just kind of by taunting them. And that was what the siege engineers had suggested. They're like, you don't want to go over there where he's fortified. Make him come to you. Because he has the home field advantage. And so he does. And this battle is so significant that he and his men took 2,000 prisoners. Not including the people they killed, but 2,000 prisoners. 
So Alex uses this to sweep down this coastline. See how he goes all the way to Egypt here? So he sweeps down the coastline of Asia Minor, finds himself in Syria with Darius III, and his Persian forces were waiting for him in the city of Issus. And it's like, it's I-S-S-U-S, -S -S, Issus. So they're waiting for him there. Here the Macedonians and the Persians fought in the second battle of the campaign. There is actually one point in this battle that I think is very significant, and here's why. It is in this battle that Darius and um, Alex, now keep in mind, Darius himself has 35,000 soldiers. I'm sorry, Alex himself has 35,000 soldiers. We can assume that, I mean, Darius probably has at least 30,000 as well. But there is a point in the battle when the men actually come face to face. They are actually fighting face to face. It scared Darius so much because he realizes he is losing the battle, and he flees, and he takes his army with it. Now, the Greeks used this to celebrate and prove that Darius was a coward. However, the Persian king, it seems, realized that the best thing for him to do was to stay alive and get his army out there because they were getting beaten. Sometimes it is not your day, right? Sometimes you are better off to leave and go somewhere else. And that's what the Persians basically teach, is that it was best for him to try to defend his empire elsewhere because where he was, it was a big failure. He wanted better footing. However, this gets interesting because Darius escaped in such a hurry that he left all the women in his family behind. Now, oftentimes when a territory was conquered, what would happen to their wives and their children? Do you know? They would be taken oftentimes to be slaves. They might be killed. You're right. They might be sacrificed. And so Alex doesn't kill them. He spares their lives, and he does not turn them into slaves, which he could have done. Oftentimes the women are used as prostitutes, basically. I mean, he doesn't do that. He actually treated them as hostages with respect. So, and I think that's kind of an interesting point there. But again, of course, this is mostly told through people who were supportive of Alexander. But we have nothing to show otherwise. So, you know. From Isus, Alex led his men southward through Phoenicia and along the coastline here. So here you see them going down through here. Now, um, with this, many of the towns just simply accepted Alexander as their new king. If you knew that he was going to come in and conquer you, or if you just could accept it, maybe you had to pay a little fee or something until the next guy comes in and conquers, sometimes you take one for the team, right? Especially when he's got 35,000 men. So, when the army reached Egypt, they found the inhabitants unwilling to fight at all. Like, he was planning to go in and conquer Egypt, but it didn't go down like that at all. In fact, Egypt pretty much surrendered themselves, and they declared the conqueror, Alex, as their new favorite. So Alex comes in, and they're like, hey, you're the new favorite. Because there was no resistance, Alex and his men like were infatuated with Egypt, and they spent the winter of 332 B.C. there. So the winter of 332 B.C. was spent in Egypt. Basically, they were exhausted, as you can imagine, because if you go back in your notes and look, I believe it was 334 or 5 when he leaves uh, Greece for the first time. Yeah, 334. So, I mean, you know, this is two years he's been on the road. And so it's not like he can just run back to Greece. It's, it's a long way. And so he decides to kind of chill out. They spend the winter there, and they're off and running. So he decided to keep his men occupied. And outside of Egypt, they're going to construct a new city. And they're going to name that city Alexandria. Because, I mean, hey, if you're building a city, you may as well name it after yourself, right? So outside of Egypt... They're going to construct the city of Alexandria. And if you look here on the map, there's Egypt. There is Alexandria right on the coastline. 
Now, why is this such a big deal? Well, because Alex wanted it to be an, a very important city of Greek culture. He hired a Greek architect to build it, and it became the center of this Hellenistic or Greek culture and illustrated the key to Alexander's occupation. One of the things he wants to do is to impose Greek culture on the rest of the world. So that is one of his other major goals. The main thing that Alexandria is remembered for, though, is for what it offers to scholars. For what it offers to scholars. You see, Alexandria has the largest library that existed at the time. Now, when we say library today, I mean, you can get books on anything. You can get them on your phones. You can get them on your computers. You can get them printed. Like, sometimes you can go to stores and buy books for, like, just a couple dollars. Books back then were all handwritten. Every single word was handwritten because there was no printing press yet. Way, hundreds of years, thousands of years for the printing press. Not quite 2,000, but close. So it just didn't exist. So what Alex does is he spends his resources purchasing and finding these books that have been written all around the world and resources, or around their world, I should say. And with this, he locates these at his new library. He wants it to be a center of culture and a place where educated men can come and study. Scholars from around the world gravitated. Many important figures in academic fields would study there. And the city also produced a great amount of fine art. Now, in 333, 331, excuse me, Alex left Egypt. He traveled through Palestine. So we see him coming back through here. He whips around. He travels through Palestine and uh, back into northern Iran so he could gather some supplies that his men needed. When he and his men left Babylon, the city's inhabitants surrendered and welcomed him with great ceremony. So once again, things are going pretty easy for him at this point. Uh, he and his folks are going to destroy the city of Persepolis. And uh, basically, they do that because that is a key city to the Persians. Uh, Persepolis, just to remind you how that is spelled. Just the S. And so they do manage to destroy this key city, but still, he wants to finish the Persians. He wants to take possession of any Persian territory because he feels like that is a way to prevent a revolt. And he does not want to revolt. So Darius was the city, um, Darius the third was in the city of Ecbatania, and it is BC. B-A-T-A-N-A. -A -A. So that's where Darius is kind of hiding out. And he knows that sooner or later, Alex is going to find him or they're going to have to face off. And so while he's there, he is trying to raise another army pretty unsuccessfully. And so by this point, you can see where he's made it to Babylon. And he's moving on down. That's where they destroy Persepolis. And so he's there's Equitania. So he's moving up to those places. All right, so by now, in 329 B.C., Alex and his army are heading through Afghanistan, chasing Darius III. Now, by this point, Darius still calls himself the king of Persia, but he almost owns none of Persia anymore anyway. Alex has basically taken over everything, so to call himself the king of Persia is a little bit of a misnomer, but... You know, hey, he feels good about what he has. So Alex moves his army towards India in the hot summer of, seven, uh, of 327. So 327, he is in India. Now, by 323, Alex was ready to embark upon his second campaign. This was all his first campaign. So, I mean, you're looking at here, guys, he's been doing this for 10 years. He's ready to go. He's excited. However, his plans are going to come to a sudden end. 
Why is that? Because Alexander the Great comes down with a fever. Now, we know fever is a sign of sickness or infection, right? Here's the thing. Just like with anything else, the more physically worn down your body is, the more susceptible you are to disease, right? Years. Alex is 33 years old. He has been heavily drinking. He's had war wounds over the years, which would mean small infections. He has had lots of issues. And so his body cannot fight off the fever. We don't know 100% what killed him because, you know, back then they believed that that fever was the problem. We now know fever is a symptom, not a problem in itself. And so anyway, scholars have basically speculated based on what is written about his death here, that pretty much it either had to be typhoid or malaria. Does his symptoms seem to be consistent with someone who contracts typhoid or malaria? And both were common in those areas. Um, typhoid, I, it's a type of disease that you can contract. I know malaria you get by mosquito bite. Mm -hmm. And it is, um, what it, it, malaria is bacterial. I, is I think, I was going to say, I think typhoid is too, because you can take, um, you can take a shot for both of those today. Well, actually malaria, you take malaria pills. Um, I can't believe I can't think of this right now, but. The, the COVID drug that President Trump was promoting, is it hydrochlora, whatever it is, yeah. that is actually malaria pills. It's used to treat malaria. And it's worked against malaria for, you know, many years. I, when I was in India, I took malaria pills because they still have some problems with malaria there. And, you know, just didn't want to get them to take like one a week. And it prevents you from getting them. So. I'm not sure. I know it's supposed to make it very unlikely, you know? And so I don't exactly understand how it does that unless your body just kind of builds up to it. But you take like, it's been a long time, but I think you take for like a couple of weeks before you go, you take the time that you're there and then you take for a couple of weeks after you come home. So I guess that if your body has it, it helps it to fight the infection. I'm not completely sure, but anyway, um, but yeah, it makes it, it's very successful against it. All right, so let's talk about some connections to the Greek world here. So Macedonia, remember, is the region. Uh, if you look at the green there, Macedonia is the region of the, in the north of Greece. Some historians believe that Macedonians were actually close cousins to the Greeks. Others think they weren't related and that they were more closely tied to the Slavic tribes. Whatever the origin, and we will probably... Never really know. Maybe maybe we will because DNA testing is getting better all the time. But there's going to end up being so much intermarrying over the next 2,000 years between the Greeks and the Macedonians that it becomes pretty hard to trace. But the Macedonians had come to appreciate Greek culture by the time Philip II was king. Philip himself had benefited from Greek knowledge when he became a prisoner in Thebes before he became king. And along with the other prisoners, Philip lived a good life of relative freedom and privilege in Thebes. And so while he lived in Thebes as a prisoner, Alex's dad, that's when he fell in love with Greek culture. And so that's why they feel the need to spread this Greek culture to other places is because he thinks that it is the best. I also love the fact that while he's in prison, he's studying Greek culture and Greek military strategy. I mean... That's kind of interesting that those strategies will be used to take over Thebes later. So when Alex himself was on his journey, one of the things he actually did because of his love for Greek culture is he is going to stop in the city of Troy. He stops in the city of Troy on his adventure because he himself knew this legend of the Trojan horse. And so he wanted to go there and actually see Troy and kind of have that moment. Now, a little bit about Olympia and her background. She was a princess. She was a princess from northwest Greece. Uh, it would be near what's present-day Albania. And she was renowned for both her beauty and her quick, um, her quick nature, especially her fiery temper. 
Some of her contemporary people from back home believe that she had religious affiliations with an odd cult. I mean, now the fact that she kind of feels like she and Zeus had a baby together, you know, doesn't make that seem legitimate at all, right? Uh, as we said, that she had lost her kind of connection there with Philip. Uh, and some other things that we do see, one other thing to mention to you is this connection. I mentioned to you about the or oracle and Oedipus. So before Alexander the Great left with his army, he went to the town of Delphi. And Delphi is kind of a big religious place in the community of, um, there we go, in the community of the Greeks, the Greeks. And he said while he was there that the oracle told him that he was invincible. Now, invincible means you can't be beaten. And so that actually, Alex claimed that was why he had no fear, because he believed the oracle. And so he really, his army seemed to be invincible, right? Now, his physical body, not so much. But that is why he just keeps going and keeps fighting, is because he had no fear that he would be beaten, because that's what was prophesied. Another name that you have to discuss when learning about Alexander the Great is Aristotle. Now, you may not know who Aristotle is per se, but you know he's important, right? And you know he is associated with um, science. And so Aristotle is going to be a tutor that Philip hired uh, to teach his son, to educate him. And so Alexander the Great is educated by Aristotle, who, of course, was considered to be one of the most brilliant men who have ever lived. Alex was so uh, infatuated with what he was taught by Aristotle. Kind of interesting story here. Uh, Aristotle taught him everything from philosophy to science. Most important, though, perhaps, is he exposed Alexander to the epic poem, which we have talked about several times and you have an assignment related to, called the Iliad. Alex was so obsessed with that, he actually carried his copy. Aristotle gave it to Alex. He carried it with his mentor's notes when he conquered all of the lands in Asia, he had it with him. And so it was almost like he was on a little boy adventure in a lot of ways. He was going to these places that he had read about. Some other people who were known to have connected with Alexander the Great and benefited from his library are going to be Plato and Socrates. Uh, also huge names in the scientific community. So some other things to mention about the Hellenistic world. It is going to begin a Greek migration to the territories that Alex conquered. Why do they do this? Well, these areas were great for growing food. Greece had become kind of highly populated, so as they start to spread out, they're able to acquire more food. If you learn nothing from kind of our course of empires here, I think it's pretty evident that food is always something that motivates us, right? If societies don't have enough to eat, they're going to continue to expand and look for new ways. So, Alexander's conquests do open up huge areas to Greek migration, which are going to continue for around 80 years. All right. So, um, just kind of to, to bring this to a close, if you will, the Greek and Macedonian colonists are going to kind of take over the areas that they go to. In fact, to the point to where they exclude many of the native people, from the military and civic government institutions. It's almost like American colonization by the Europeans. The natives kind of get flushed out and the invaders kind of take over. The influence of non-Greeks on Greeks was carried out by the movement of these people and ideas. There was a lot of this with both the Jewish and the Egyptian cultures that are going to become a part of kind of the Greek culture as well. All right. And lastly, the library. Alexandria, this library constructed by Alex, is going to become a home for scientific research. 
Great advancements in anatomy, physiology, and pathology are going to uh, exist there. It is here that by the year, uh, you can see kind of some artistic works of what it may have looked like. And you see this new area of Europe develop as part of this. Now, it is in this library, um, and because of this, that we start to see images of Greek things in other places. So this particular old statue is in India. And notice to the right, to the left, sorry, of um, the Buddha here. Actually, this would be the yogi. You can see Hercules. And so we start to see these images spread throughout all of these different cult cultures because of the influence of Alexander the Great. Here's another one. This is a tapestry from the Middle East, and it has kind of a scimitar here, half man, half horse. And so you see different things that show that Greek influence and how they all fit together. And so what makes Hellenistic civilization what it is, and I thought this was so good at explaining it, is you see Greek civilization and Persian civilization and Indian civilization, like actual India, not Native American, and Egyptian civilization all kind of merge into like this new culture, if you will. All right. And so that is what we have. Uh, on Thursday, I'm going to talk to you about the Romans. See if I can end this. And I have a video to show you. And then you